my uh, great pleasure to welcome you, and uh, but I will be turning it over to Nancy Hornberger uh, soon for the introduction of our speaker. I do uh, uh, want to just share a couple observations with you. Uh, uh, Nessa Wilson uh, uh, was uh, uh, an esteemed member of our faculty. Uh, she, I think, can be uh, thanked for many things, among them uh, positioning us in the Graduate School of Education to take a uh, global leadership role in the teaching of English as a second language. Uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, there is uh, in that area both the social side and the cognitive side that she was probably on the social side. And I see her husband is here in front row, so uh, welcome. Uh, uh, but it probably reminds most of us in the room, since Nessa had an untimely death in 1990, of the untimely death of our very own, also beloved, Terry Pika. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it, it allows me to recognize one of the reasons why we are a global leader in teaching English as a second language, because we address both the social and the cognitive side. On the side. And I can't help myself but to just recognize Nelson Flores, one of our uh, brand new assistant professors in TESOL. Terrific to have you with us. I hear nothing but rave reviews. I happened to walk by his class the other day and he was speaking with great animation and I, I was mesmerized. He <laughs> my nose to the glass and he waved me in. And I, was, you know, I, I was just delighted for that opportunity. But, uh, I think uh, Nelson is going to be a, a real wonderful find for us. So thank you for being here. And I will just mention to those of you who uh, 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 could, could maybe know of someone else who should be joining us that we are doing a search again this year also for an assistant professor. And of course, we're looking for only the best and the brightest, the, the pen quality folks. But uh, uh, please keep that in mind and uh, steer them our way. That search is well underway. We have many applicants already, uh, as you might imagine. So uh, again, uh, uh, I won't introduce our speaker, but thank you for being here. I'll turn it over uh, to Nancy Hornberg. Welcome to everybody. Welcome back to, if you're coming back, to the Nessa Wilson Colloquium and to the new academic years. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here, new and returning colleagues and students, alumni and friends, Barbie and Judy Wolfson, and your family members that I know are about to arrive, um, for this annual Nessa Wolfson Colloquium honoring as Andy said, the memory of Nessa Wolfson, founding director of educational linguistics. And um, I got to the point a few years ago when I realized I had to keep track of, we've been you know, doing this for many years now. This is the 22nd Nessa Wolfson Colloquium. And it's the uh, 36th birthday of educational linguistics. Wow. Wow. So we've been around a while, and maybe some, you know, you earn some credit just for being around, right? <laughs> just like uh, what Big Allen said, the path of life is showing up or something, 90%. I'm not going to that number. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I <yeah. laughs> All right. I did also want to acknowledge, as Andy just did, that this is the first time we celebrate the book without Terry here, and I know that we all miss her. Um, just for those of you who didn't have a chance to meet Terry personally. Professor Terry Pika completed her own PhD here in educational linguistics in 1982. She was the second PhD in educational linguistics. And then she went on to 30 years of dedicated service to educational linguistics in GSE and Penn as a faculty member. She was here with Nessa at the founding of educational linguistics and she was a steady and caring presence throughout all that time until her passing last November. And uh, since life is a way of bringing us new as well as <laughs> the losses that we experience, um, I, did, I thought I would take a moment, I 
haven't normally done this, but just to acknowledge and thank the, my educational linguistics colleagues. Um, I think all or most of whom are here, or will be by the time uh, you know, we get rolling. Um, and so we have Professor Yuko Butler, Professor Betsy Rhines, I'm not sure she's here yet, um, Nelson, who we'll meet in a minute. We have a wonderful staff. Um, I was you know, thinking in, in Europe they call faculty staff, so I, um, I get confused as to who's faculty and who's there. Um, Diana Paninos, Santu Wagner, and comrades, Joe Pondo, Bob Moore. I know that many of you have met these folks in your classes, but in case you haven't, I just want you to know everybody's here. Uh, these are the folks that make these programs the shining light that they are. I'm very grateful to all of you. I want to also, before passing over to Nelson, offer a special welcome to Ophelia Garcia, nationally and internationally recognized for her devoted work and her really conceptually rich uh, leadership, scholarship in uh, dynamic and emerging bilingualism, <laughs> bilingual education and the education of language minorities, grounded always in her long-term commitment to the Latino communities of New York City. I don't think there's any scholar maybe in the US today who knows the Latino communities as well as And I'll just say one personal thing. Um, Ophelia and I go back to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. We share a wonderful mentor, Joshua Fishman. And really, Joshua brought us together um, on the occasion of his 65th birthday when Ophelia invited me to contribute to a festival mm -hmm. to honor him on bilingual education. And then 15 years later, mm -hmm. we got to bring Ophelia here, back here, for another festival. <laughs> Joshua Fishman's honor um, on his 80th birthday. And, and Ophelia and I edited um, a pair of volumes mm -hmm. on the theme of language loyalty for that occasion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's OK to mention this, perhaps, because uh, there's also a link, for me anyway, between Professor Fishman and these programs. Um, I remember, and Nessa. I remember Nessa telling me, um, maybe I think shortly after she hired me, that it was Fishman's letter of recommendation for me that first brought the search mm -hmm. committee's attention to, to my you know, application. I was just a new PhD. Mm -hmm. So thank you, mm -hmm. Professor Fishman. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Nessa, mm -hmm. for recognizing that I did fit in here, even though I'm not a specialist mm -hmm. in TESOL. Um, so, I'm not with my personal stuff. We're grateful to Bridget Goodman for coordinating the event and to several PhD and master's students who pitch in also. Are they the ones standing up there? No, they're the only ones sitting at the back. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> sitting at the back. That's what so often is the case. Thank you all. Um, this couldn't happen without you. And then I'll, my last comments are, of course, about the colloquium and the beloved and remembered colleague it honors. Um, Nessa Wolfson earned her PhD here at Penn in linguistics and was a lecturer and then a, later a professor of education at GSE from 1976 up until her passing in 1990. She was the founding director under Dean Del Hines of three of GSE's most long-standing programs, the programs that, that most of you, I know we may have some LLE group faculty and students here, and I'm very happy to see that, to see you all. Welcome, please, to you also. But I, I wanted to especially recognize that these three educational linguistics programs um, that Nessa founded and that are still living and thriving today um, are, were celebrating those as well. And um, she also was the founding chair of the Language and Education Division, which is the direct predecessor of the Language and Literacy and Education Division and now group. So um, that's another enduring legacy that, that we can uh, thank Nessa for her vision in helping to get started. Um, she was also the first tenured woman professor at GSE. So we do have a very remarkable uh, predecessor to look to. Her death came too soon for both her family and her colleagues. And Harvey, um, along with, at that time, Terry Peeper was the chair of the division, um, 
created this colloquium to recognize her scholarly and program building contributions and to keep her memory alive. And we've developed the colloquium um, as an opportunity to bring two educational linguistics into GSE each year, a distinguished scholar who represents um, the, the fields that Nessa also worked in um, broadly, TESOL and sociolinguistics and to give a talk and meet informally with students. Um, the speakers are always called on, not just to give a talk, but to hang around and meet, and they've, they're very, Ophelia and others have been so generous in doing that. It's a great opportunity for our students. We emphasize scholars who knew and mentored Nessa, who worked with her as a colleague, who were her own students, um, who draw inspiration from her research and writings, or whose work represents the same high standards of originality and vision as hers. And we, we've, over the years, we've developed the practice of hosting it early in the year um, in order to welcome our new students, to welcome back our, you know, our continuing students, ourselves. Um, Joanna Siegel just said a minute ago, it's, it's our national holiday. <laughs> Education <laughs> Linguistics National Holiday. So I like that image. Um, we do take time off. People appear from wherever they're you know, busy doing and come to celebrate the programs and to um, show our gratitude also to the Wilson family for making this possible and for coming and participating with us each year. So I'm going to now turn the podium over to our newest colleague, Nelson Flores. And we'll tell you why he's especially appropriate to introduce our speaker today. First, I just wanted to welcome everyone again. Welcome to the GSE faculty who have been wonderful to me so far. Welcome to our dean who's also been wonderful. Welcome to the Wilson family who I'm just meeting right now, um, but I'm very excited to speak with later and to hear more about Nessa, who sounds like a wonderful person. Um, and I want to take a special thank you to a welcome to my students. Many of my students are here today. I see some of you way in the back. Um, raise your hands. Uh, I um, almost bullied them to come, I think. I want to you how to come. Um, so I'm very happy to see all of you here today. Um, so I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing um, Dr. Ophelia Garcia. Um, and she's currently a professor in the PhD program of urban education in Hispanic and Russo Brazilian literatures and language at the Graduate Center of the New York University. Um, I was a second year doctoral student when she came to our program in urban education. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that she completely transformed our program. <laughs> She'll say she didn't, and she's very humble and modest, but she completely transformed our program. Not only did she bring cutting edge reconceptualizations of bilingualism and bilingual education, but she also provided the kind of mentorship for her students that only she could give. And if I'm half as good a mentor as she was, then I think you guys will be very lucky. Um, I've gotten to know Ophelia very well over the last five years. Um, the more I got to know Ophelia, the more I realized that this is how she's been throughout her entire career. Um, she's always provided cutting edge thinking about bilingual education and bilingualism. And she's always been a wonderful mentor to her students. Um, in fact, she began her career as a bilingual teacher in New York City public schools um, at a time where bilingual education was just really emerging as an option for Latino students in the city. Um, so she really was a pioneer in both advocating for this approach um, and designing what this would look like for students. And of course, history has vindicated her because it's been shown that these programs are superior to programs that are English only. Um, now, after her earning her PhD in Hispanic and Russo Brazilian literatures and languages at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, Ophelia has worked in various academic positions and has worked as a scholar to reimagine bilingualism and as an advocate to impact bilingual education programming. She's been a professor of bilingual education at the City College of New York. She has been the dean of the School of Education at the Brooklyn College of Long Island University. And most recently, before coming to the Graduate Center, she was Professor of Bilingual Education at Columbia University's Teachers College. Ophelia's scholarship has been internationally recognized. 
Um, again, she'll say it's not, but it is. Um, and, and in fact, her most her recent book, Bilingual Education in the 21st Century, A Global Perspective, which everyone here should read if you haven't, Bilingual Education in the 21st Century, A Global Perspective, um, <laughs> has introduced concepts yeah, such as emergent bilingual, translanguaging, and dynamic bilingualism that have revolutionized the field of bilingual education and language education policy more broadly. Um, I know that you'll hear more about these concepts in her presentation, so I'm not going to define them for you now. But um, her other recent books include Educating Emerging Bilinguals, which she co-authored with Joanne Clayton, um, The Handbook of Language and Ethnic Identity, which she did with Joshua Fishman, um, Negotiating Language Policies in School, Educators as Policymakers, which she did with Kate Menken from the Queen's College, um, and Imagining Multilingual Schools with Tobias Gubnekandes, Maria Torres Guzman, and a reader in bilingual education with Colin Baker. She's also the Associate General Editor of the International Journal of the Sociology of Language. So one thing that you'll find out about Ophelia if you get to know her well is that she's writing a million things at once, <laughs> um, which is the only way she's able to publish as much as, she's, as she publishes. Um, however, though she's certainly a prolific writer, Ophelia has never taken her eyes off the prize of improving the education of emergent bilingual students. Um, I can speak from first-hand experience that Ophelia is always working with schools and communities in an attempt at merging theory and practice. Um, one recent example of this is her work as a co-principal investigator of the CUNY New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals, a project that I had the fortune of working on for a year, um, a project that is supporting principals and teachers of 27 New York City schools and utilizing translanguaging as a pedagogical tool. Um, the changes in programmatic and teaching practices at the schools have been amazing. Um, and it's a reminder that theory and practice can meet in ways that benefit our children. Um, I can continue to talk about affiliate accomplishment for hours, um, and I'm sure you'd rather hear her talk, though. Um, so I just wanted to end with a special thank you for Ophelia for everything she's done for me. Um, I wouldn't be here at Penn if it hadn't been for her guidance. Um, she's done more for me than words can say. Um, Ophelia, you've helped provide me a model for engaged scholarship that shows me that academic knowledge doesn't have to occur in a vacuum, but can be produced in collaboration with schools and communities. Um, you've shown me the beauty of my own bilingualism and my own voice. And <laughs> in short, you've shown me that what I have to say is important and that I need to make myself heard. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you but so I much. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Uh, he may not cry, but I, I may. Um, así que buenos días a todos y gracias por estar con nosotros. Um, I, uh, it's real, a real privilege for me to be here today. Thank you so much for sponsoring this lecture series. Um, I never met Nessa Wolfson, but I'm sure she must be a wonderful person if uh, we can still do this after 22 years. So um, thank you. Um, to me, it's, it's amazing to be here today um, because uh, I have old and new connections to UPenn. Um, as Nancy said, uh, we go way back. Uh, we've been in many places together. Her husband and I were reminiscing about a wonderful trip through the Delta in, uh, was it in Buenos Aires? Buenos Aires. Yes. Uh, and uh, so um, besides Joshua Fishman in common, um, I have uh, learned a lot from Nancy over the years. I think that her theoretical model of the continuum of biliteracy has affected all our work and is still <coughs> impacting all our work every day. So uh, I thank you. I mean, that's a wonderful image to have, this continuum of people, right? Um, N Nancy, at the beginning, uh, Nelson, hopefully not at the end, uh, <laughs> but certainly um, Nelson, who uh, uh, can now do much better what I used to do. And so I found it very difficult to think of, what am I going to do at UPenn? Because Nelson can do much better what I used to do. So I'm doing something different today. Um, but you know, you think about all the continua. Um, I have here also in the audience uh, classmates of my own daughter who were from Swarthmore who are now at UPenn and I remember having that conversation with Nancy in Argentina about Swarthmore, my daughter wanting to go to Swarthmore. So 
I mean, uh, the world is a continuum, and what we have to think about are the connections among all of us and how we can make meaning to improve the lives of all of us, and especially those who are, who are not fortunate enough um, through these connections. So thank you so much for making this happen and, and uh, inviting me to be part of a little part of a program about which I've, I have had such admiration. Uh, educational linguistics is certainly very near to my heart and the people that have made this uh, program possible uh, have <coughs> impacted the field beyond words, uh, beyond what words can say. And I also remember Terry Pika today and uh, um, acknowledge both our losses and our uh, good co new contributions and how that continua will continue regardless of absences. Um, and I want to, before I start, make sure that I thank uh, both Sofia Chaparro, who picked me up from the station, and otherwise I wouldn't have gotten here, <laughs> because I left early this morning, and Brigitte Goodman, whose organization is fantastic and has uh, gotten all of us here today. So, muchas gracias a todos por estar con nosotros, and Thank you, Nelson. I love you, too. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me just give you an overview of what I'm going to do today. Um, what I, the question that I'm asking is uh, when, how, and for what purposes are non-dominant language and identity practices used in schooling? And uh, because I want to give you a preview of what we're going to do, I want to start with telling you that some of what, what I'm going to say is that really strong language practices and strong identity practices, practices are necessary, but they're not sufficient to make sure that these languages are included in schooling, that different sociolinguistic, both internal and external, more sociopolitical uh, factors, uh, result in very various uh, schooling arrangements, and thirdly, that state schools use different mechanisms for control of various language and identity practices. Um, I want to do this by uh, thinking about four different cases. Diagonally, you find uh, two European countries, France and uh, uh, Luxembourg. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to speak about Gallo, which is a language spoken on the western coast, Brittany of France and about basically Luxembourgish and uh, all the languages of Luxembourg, this landlocked country uh, between Germany, Belgium, and France. And then on the other two diagonals, I want to talk a little bit about um, two languages of Chiapas, uh, Mexico, and then uh, the Maori language in New Zealand, so two indigenous languages. So we have two European languages, two indigenous languages, and of course in the middle, what I want to do is make sure that uh, we go back to the case that I always care about, which is Spanish in the U.S. and Latinos in the U.S. So I want to talk about that uh, and sort of think what can we learn about these four cases in order to think about what is the state of Spanish in the U.S. I want to start by defining the two terms that I'm using because I think it's important to make sure that we understand what it is that we're saying and also by presenting a caveat. Uh, and for me, ethnifying is just the practice, the acting, the using of the, the identity practices. And these are the identity price, pra uh, practices are either assumed, that is, uh, we self-perceive them, they're phenomenological, or sometimes they're imposed, they're assigned by others, and sometimes they're negotiated. And these practices are often used for sociocultural organization. That's all I mean by that. And I then want to make sure that we understand what languaging is. Uh, and languaging, to me, is uh, the language practices that really constitute us and, they are, and that are the product of social practices that, at the same time, bring language practices about. And I want to say that languaging is also assumed in post or negotiated. So I'm, I'm working with that definition and not the old definition of language as just a system of structures with which you listen, speak, read, or write. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's more the social uh, definition uh, from a sociocultural perspective. 
And then the caveat, and the caveat is that uh, not all groups have the same languaging and ethnifying options, right? It's not equal, not everybody has the same options, um, and certainly there's a lot of restriction of these options for many minoritized communities, and that there is a very important link between uh, li your language practices, your identity practices, and power and that these cannot be separated from other power relations or the political arrangements of nation states and many social factors, yes, ethnicity and language, but also class, race, sex, that really impact on these options and the choices that are offered to children especially in schools in terms of what practices are allowed as well as the valuing of those practices. So, Without those two definitions, so that we understand that we're talking about practices and then the caveat that I've made, I want to explore this relationship between language practices, identity practices, and schooling in four sociolinguistic cases. And then think, what can we learn about these cases for our own? <clears throat> One difficulty with this talk is I'm going to take you through five cases, so it's long. And one advantage is that Every time I start with a case, you may tune in again if you get bored. Uh, so uh, it gives you some choices there. So I want to talk. I want to first talk about a um, a language that we don't hear much about, and that is Gallo. Gallo is a language spoken in Upper Brittany, France. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the yellow on the western side, uh, the, the language next to Breton, right? It's um, very much there. Now something that you should know about the linguistics of Gallo is that it is a Romance language and it's spoken by about 5% of the population. Um, that it is used very regularly in the local media, in cultural events, in music, but that it lacks an orthographic accepted standard. There are two competing standards of Gallo, one which is very distant from French, which a lot of scholars and linguists prefer because it means then that you're separating it from French. And then the other standard is um, more accepted and, um, uh, by the teachers and uh, wanted by the teachers because since it's closer to French, it's easier for the children to, uh, to learn. So one of the issues that we have with Gala, Gallo is that there are two competing orthographic standards and that it is often uh, not written, it's written rarely, but it is used a lot in uh, orally. Now what are the sociopolitics of Gallo? This is taking the sociolinguistic question to the more macro-political level. Well, France refuses to recognize it as a regional language, and they just think of it as, they talk about it as if it's just a façon de parler, right? A way of speaking. It is just a dialect, it's a way of speaking, it's not a language. At the same time, the, it, within Brittany, there's opposition to recognition of Gallo, and this has to do with the fact, of course, that Breton is a Celtic language, it's spoken mostly in, in the region, and it would compete with Breton. So there is this fear that if Gallo was accepted as a, a regional language, it would then take um, some of the power or some of the advantages that have now been given to Breton as a regional language. What is happening in schools? And I'll do this for these four cases. We'll take it sociolinguistically first, then sociopolitically, and then taking it into schools. Well, it's taught as a subject. It's actually taught as a traditional language <coughs> subject, but it's optional. People can take it or people do not have to take it. And as you see, mostly at the elementary level, very little at intermediate and secondary schools. And the whole uh, ethos behind the teaching of Gallo within French schools is that this is something that is just something that these people want, it's a heritage way of speaking, and it's really not accepted <coughs> otherwise, because what really counts is French. Oops. Um, so, 
Uh, if we were to evaluate what's going on with Gallo, we would say that uh, it has very weak language practices and identity practices. A lot of people don't feel that it's important. And a very weak language education policy that only recognizes it as an optional subject uh, taken by very, very few students, only at the <coughs> elementary level. And Gallo always taught separately from French as if it was something that cannot contaminate French. Uh, and of course, the consequences are that very few of us even have any consciousness of Gallo. It's complete erasure to talk about uh, with the terms of um, uh, the people who do uh, language ideologies, Kriti, um, Irvine, etc. Gallo <coughs> Muller. Let's now go to um, Mexico, and we are going to now think about the case of Tzotzil and Celtal. Tzotzil and Celtal, for those of you who are not familiar with it, are uh, uh, languages, Mayan languages, that are spoken in Chiapas, Mexico. Chiapas, of course, is a state that is the southernmost part of, of Mexico. It's closer to Guatemala. The languages are mutually intelligible, and that's why I'm considering them um, together. Um, Cezal and Tzotzil are spoken by 21% of the population of Chiapas. The uh, percentages of speakers of Mayan languages is a lot greater, it's almost half in this region, but these two Mayan languages are spoken by about a fourth of the population. But what is interesting also is to remember that one-third of those speakers are monolingual speakers of Sotzil and Celtal. That is, they're not bilingual with Spanish. This is a poor state in Mexico. 90% uh, of the people uh, do not have any running water. And until very recently, until the end of the 20th century, there were no rural schools in this area. Now, something that we also have to remember about these languages is that these were the languages of the Zapatistas, and all of us that know about the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional know that on the 1st of, Je of January of 1994, the Zapatistas had uh, a revolution in which one of their claims was that they had the right to work, to land, to home, to food, to health and an education in their languages, so that this that this is important. There were agreements, the Acuerdos de San Andres, with the Mexican government that actually were signed in 1996, recognizing the pluralism of uh, Mexico uh, and of this area in particular, the pluralism, the linguistic, cultural, and ethnic pluralism, uh, recognized indigenous autonomy over local government and recognized a policy of agrarian reform. However, it's also important to remember that even though these accords were signed, uh, these accords were also ignored. But there was some uh, advancement as a result of these, um, of these accords, and that had, to, uh, that had an impact at the national scene. So what we have is in 2002, changes to the Mexican Constitution for the first time really recognizing Mexico as a, as a pluricultural state. And in 2003, uh, the law that gives uh, language rights to indigenous peoples of Mexico, recognizing Spanish and 63 indigenous languages as national languages with the same value wherever they're spoken. Also important was that this law of 2003, for the first time, guaranteed transitional bilingual education for indigenous peoples in the initial grades. That is, the use of their languages uh, for initial instruction. Um, this, of course, then was uh, made into law by uh, this. Um, um, this uh, organism that coordinates intercultural bilingual education that uh, uh, made it possible to use 
what was then called la lingua originaria, the original language, the uh, recognition that these were the original languages of Mexico and not Spanish, in transitional bilingual education. And so Tzil and Celtal were, were taught in the first grades as the elementary foundations for Spanish. Now, one thing that we need to consider is that this was supposed to be a case of subtractive bilingualism, that is, a case of using these indigenous languages to make sure, uh, and by adding them to Spanish, it would then turn out that students would be Spanish monolinguals. But the policy was carried out in such a poor way that of course it failed. And I always say that rather than have the monocycle, that for me is the image and the symbol of being monolingual, right? Because you don't have two wheels, you only have one. Uh, what you have is a flat bicycle tire, right? Because with this, what, what they have done is literally they have taken the air out of these very bright, vibrant languages by using them too little, too, um, too late. Um, in ways uh, that are not effective in any kind of way. Do you have any doubt about it? Um, uh, the Secretaría de Educación Pública, the CEP, la CEP, the uh, National Ministry of Education, puts out a textbook in these languages, which is used throughout um, these schools in uh, Chiapas. <coughs> Uh, but this is what schools look like. This is uh, from a study we did uh, with Patricia Velasco maybe three years ago. Um, and what you see, of course, is um, schools that may be teaching in Celtal and Sotzil, uh, but that look like this without any, um, any um, with, with just a dirt floor and with water that comes in through the walls, right? So the fact that you're using one language or the other really doesn't make too much of a difference, right? <laughs> so that's what they look like. I could show you a lot more. But I think in order to summarize uh, and in order not to bore you with more details, um, what we have to recognize is that uh, there is very strong languaging and ethnifying in these uh, in these places. That is, these languages are alive and well in these rural communities um, and they are tied to their own cultural uh, <coughs> practices. But there's a very weak language education policy that uses transitional bilingual education and I would say insufficient transitional bilingual education. Um, and it's insufficient because sometimes uh, in some of these schools where we were, the teachers had a third grade education. Um, and this has to do with the fact that they did not have any schools uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and so it takes a very long time for a system to change in order to really uh, educate everyone. Uh, and these teachers were, were in the... Um, in that zone of uh, having been schooled in Spanish, not enough, and uh, even though they're speakers of these languages, really never having been schooled in these languages. So it's very difficult for them to think of how these languages could be used in instruction. So what happens is one day they may use them, the next day they never, do and it's all um, very, very insufficient. Really, I, I say it's a whisper of these languages. You catch a whisper of these languages among the teachers, a lot among the children, especially in the early grades because uh, the young children do not speak Spanish. So what happens is um, in these um, schools, of course, um, in, with these cases, what you have is language maintenance. For me, language maintenance in itself is not a positive concept uh, because I do think we have to think of languages not just being maintained but being sustained for the future, right? Having taken the, taking on a future position, not just how they were. Uh, and I say that they're flat because they really make them flat in school. If they, these people were very, very 
are sure of the, their language practices before they get to school, but once they get into school, they start questioning them. So, you know, that's my image of a flat tire now. And this partial majority language acquisition. The truth is that these children usually finish school in fifth grade. There are no options. There are some um, TV uh, mediated uh, high schools, uh, but very few of the kids attend. Um, and yet, um, what, what, what is important to think about is that even when these indigenous languages are being used in schools, they're being used with the purposes of making them national citizens. This is uh, the Mexican flag is a big deal. They do this uh, on Friday. There's a whole salute to the flag. And you see all the regimentation that takes place uh, during schooling. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a very troubling situation. Let's go to New Zealand now. I'm taking you around the world a little bit. So uh, <coughs> I want to talk about the social linguistics of Maori and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I think that we all know that this is an Eastern Polynesian language that was spoken and brought to New Zealand by the Maoris in the 13th century. The Europeans arrived in the 17th century. And um, <coughs> New Zealand became a British colony in 1840. And that same year, there was a treaty signed, the Treaty of Waitangi, in which it was agreed that in return for uh, New Zealand, uh, the, they, there would be protection of the Maori land, of their homes, and all their treasures, and all their taunga. Um, Maori was spoken by most Maoris until World War II, but by 1973, uh, fewer than 18% of the population spoke Maori. And today, the situation is beginning to be reversed, and 30% of the population now speaks it. Um, and now let's talk about the sociopolitics of Maori. So one thing that has happened, why has this uh, reversal of the fortune of Maori taken place, it's taken place because in 1986 there was a, a tribunal, a Waitangi tribunal, and as a result of these accords, uh, Maori, uh, Maori was guaranteed as a taunga, as a treasure, right? It was, uh, it was decided that this was their treasure and therefore had to be guaranteed and protected. Uh, there was the idea that Maori had a distinctive identity that could be recognized within New Zealand, and that they had the right to self-determination in their lands, in their territories. So in 1987, Maori was recognized, along with sign language, New Zealand sign language, by the way, as the official language, and there was this creation of the commission of the language. So what about <coughs> schools? What is happening in schools? Well, in schools, um, the Maoris, because they had lost so much of their language, because their language had, had been uh, so threatened and lost, uh, only the elders spoke it. And they came up with this idea that has now been uh, very well received all over the world, in Hawaii and other places. Uh, Nancy has uh, written about this quite a lot, um, of uh, language nests. Right, Kohanga Reos. And this, these language nests were programs in which they put the elders, the grandparents, who actually um, spoke Maori with the very uh, young children in order to make sure that the language came alive, right? And these are what are called immersion revitalization bilingual education programs. They are immersion programs, but they're different than the immersion programs that we have in Canada and Quebec, for example, because what these attempt to do is to revitalize the language, not to teach a majority language, which is, um, I'm sorry, not to teach to majorities a minority language, which is what the Canadian immersion programs do. Here what we're doing is we are revitalizing a minoritized language for a minoritized community. So it's a different kind of program, uh, even though it, it seems to be the same. 
Um, and of course, once those um, once those uh, children had spoken ability and therefore were able to really uh, carry out uh, and understand the language, then the next step was to build Farekura uh, Maori, which were elementary schools and high schools uh, eventually, that were Maori medium schools. They were immersion revitalization um, bilingual education programs. One thing that I have to um, say is that, as you all know, New Zealand has wonderful literacy practices, right? I mean, those of you who follow PISA results know that they are fifth or seventh, depending on, on what you look at, uh, in language and literacy in the world. So they, are, they have wonderful practices that then the Maori community has been able to adapt for their own children. So lots of literacy material in Maori, not just uh, the one book that the SEP produces, as we saw in the uh, Sotsil and Seltal example. Um, that's the classroom, and but there's, oh, that's also a school. Um, this was a school too, but uh, this is the same school actually. But what I want to point out again is the very strong Maori identity of these schools. Uh, they're not devastated, they're not uh, as what we saw before. Uh, this is an indigenous community that has gotten restitution and therefore has invested the money that they have gotten uh, to educate their own children uh, with very good resources and very intelligent ways of using the good literacy practices that exist in English in Maori. So what can we say then about the language in education policy in Maori? Um, what we can say is that the Maori, Maori is now being taught as a language of the Maori for a bilingual future, not as a language of the indigenous poor community that needs the support, but with the, um, the thinking that this is a language that's going to have a bilingual future and that it is that language that is going to construct a future for this community. So there is uh, an idea that we're not talking just about one wheel but that and we're really not even talking about two static wheels but we're talking about a bilingualism that is more dynamic uh, that is able to really adapt that's the image of the all-terrain vehicle right the idea that what we have, what we need to have, what, they, what these children need to have is of course English in, in the New Zealand context but also Maori and what they need to do is to be able to adapt uh, those wheels to the terrain, to the community, the terrain in which they are performing um, their schooling. Um, it is an example of what I call recursive dynamic bilingualism and what I mean by this is just the realization that um, it, our old conceptions of bilingualism were built on people who started out as monolinguals and either became bilingual, so that was the additive concept, or through schooling became monolingual again. That was a subtractive uh, um, model. But the idea was that everybody started out basically monolingual. Everybody started out at the same place. And all of us who work in classrooms know that that ju is just not possible today in the complexity and the um, uh, globalization in which we all live, the movements back and forth, etc. In the case of the Maoris, they weren't starting from nothing either. They weren't starting from zero. Uh, yes, they had lost a lot of the language, but they still had language practices in their rituals, in their homes, uh, from which they could actually bring it into the future. So the idea of recursive dynamic bilingualism is, again, you don't start from scratch, you don't add a separate language, but you go back to your, the language practices of the past, of your rituals, of your home, etc., to bring them into the future. So you're constantly doing this. It's not, not just unidirectional. Um, and I think that the Maoris have this concept. So, what can we say about the Maori case and how do we think about it? Well, I think there is strong languaging 
and strong ethnifying in the Maori community. There is, um, uh, there certainly has been a lot of language revitalization, and there is a strong language education policy for Maoris and the development of these bilingual education programs which are meant to revitalize the language. So there is this <coughs> language revitalization going on, the idea that this language has to be protected but also at the same time has to grow in the complexity of the bilingualism of the region and therefore adaptive and dynamic. Uh, and that is, I think, where they're going. Uh, they're going not uh, into the situation that I uh, displayed before of, a, of, so, of Sotzil and Celtal speakers who were now being regimented to be Mexican citizens, but actually of a future that is going to be very much a Maori future within New Zealand. And um, certainly um, the idea of these languages for the future and not not heritage languages of the past. I think we have to be careful of our use of heritage, especially when it is portrayed as languages of the past. So I think we have to figure it out. All right, and I'm going to do Luxembourg now before I take you back to the US. Um, so Luxembourg, <coughs> a very different case. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know about it, uh, Luxembourgish is a Germanic language. Um, it is, um, Luxembourg was established in 1839. Uh, the country has been occupied by Germany twice, uh, in 1914 first, and then uh, incorporated during the Third Reich. Um, but in 1984, uh, Luxembourgish, which by the way is oral, it's an oral language, it's not written. It could be written, but it's not. That's not the way people think of it, and that's important for us to think about. Um, it was uh, declared a national language, the language of the heart. It was a national language of Luxembourg. Um, Luxembourgish is spoken by 87% of the residents there and it's preferred by 57% of people there. It has spoken value, but it's hardly written. It's written usually now a lot through emails. I mean, uh, technology has actually uh, brought these possibilities, which before were not possible. So there, it has begun to be written <coughs> in, in, in emails, in informal letters, etc. but it is, it does not, people do not care that it's not written because it is their natural language, it is the language of the heart, and it's important for upward social mobility. And again, this is important for all of us to remember, because here's a case of a language that does not have advanced literacy, and yet it is very much valued because in order to have upward social mobility within, within Luxembourg, you have to speak it, you have to be able to speak it. There's also an ideology of separation from German, what Heinz Kloss called Ausbau. And it's the idea, of course, that uh, uh, we, we can, some people will, will argue, just like people argue about Gallo, that Luxembourgish is a dialect of German, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, here again, we want to think about whether languages are for real languages or are languages social constructions, national constructions sometimes. And here's a situation very similar to Gallo, and yet uh, in the case of Luxembourg, because there is national state power, it has been declared a national language, and that's it. No, no uh, discussion about it. It is a national language. Uh, of course, as a result of it being a national language, there has been an effort to separate it uh, a bit from uh, German because uh, they, we want to make sure that it has different characteristics and therefore it is constructed as different. Uh, how about the sociopolitics of the whole languaging in Luxembourg? Well, one thing that we want to make sure that we recognize is that Luxembourg is a global power. It has the world's second highest GP, GDP per capita, uh, gross uh, national product, uh, according to the uh, IMF, 
Uh, and just to give you an idea of where they might be, uh, the, the other cases that we have considered, um, the U.S., which we will in a second, is 8th, France is 23rd, New Zealand is 30th, and Mexico is 59th. Luxembourg is a second. It also has a second largest investment fund center. It has an important role in the European Union. It's a seat of all the courts. It's a seat of the investment bank. It's a seat of the Secretariat of the European Parliament, of the Translation Center, and of many departments of the European Commission. It also um, has local power, uh, this uh, language in Luxembourg. 97% of the population in Luxembourg is multilingual. And a fourth of them speak fa at, least fa at least five languages. So uh, you have to remember it's a small country, very wealthy, uh, and also landlocked, so you have Germans and French who are surrounding it, who sometimes come in and out. Uh, lots of the uh, valuing of French. Remember that, uh, that the Germans incorporated them twice in their history, so French is very much recognized as a language of prestige, so a lot of valuing of French. There has been an increase of French speakers across the border, and 44% uh, of the population is actually transborder commuters and immigrants. They come in to work and then live in France or Germany or Belgium. Um, uh, and also very important in the composition of uh, Luxembourg is that there are many Portuguese immigrants there. And this is important because then they changed the, the whole terrain of the communicative terrain, the sociolinguistics of Luxembourg. So 16% uh, of the foreigners in uh, Luxembourg are Portuguese immigrants. So Portuguese is also a very important language. Now, how about the sociopolitics of Luxembourg? Is? Well, there is, uh, or of Luxembourg basically, there is protection of Luxembourgish, but there's also a lot of emphasis on making sure that there is plurilingual development, that uh, the nation recognizes its own plurilingualism, its own multilingualism, including, of course, French, Portuguese, and English. Um, in 1984, there was this law passed uh, that, of course, declared, as I said before, Luxembourg is a national language, but then declared that French, German, and Luxembourgish were going to be the languages of administration and justice, and that French was going to be the language of legislation. Uh, if you think we have complexity, uh, this is a lot of complexity uh, in a country that, to remind you, has the second uh, largest GDP. Um, and um, there has also been some effort at uh, having some orthographic reform so Luxembourgish could be more easily visible, even though, again, that is not a value that people hold dear. So what happens in schools? Let me just take a little break. So what happens in schools is, um, again, this is a very wealthy country with a wonderful school system. Uh, they don't have to worry about things too much. Uh, and of course, school starts uh, at age three. Uh, and that schooling is done through Luxembourgish. This is, again, the language of the home, the language of the heart, the national language, the language that is spoken, not written. So the idea is that you start the, with the children uh, in the language, you educate them in the language that they understand, that they know, that they hold dear. This situation has become very complex, as you will see soon, because of course I told you that they now have a lot of Portuguese immigrants who are their laborers, and so a lot of the uh, Portuguese children come in at the age of three without really speaking Luxembourgish. So the, the situation has gotten uh, a lot more complex, but unlike us that do not do anything at the preschool level, we some, somehow think that we can start thinking about it in first grade. At the preschool, we don't think about it. Uh, what they have done is that they have really come up with a very good program of Luxembourgish development, only oral, 
in, uh, in preschool. In primary school, the situation now changes. They're interested not only in protecting Luxembourgish, but also in making sure that all the children who go to school become trilingual. That is, bilingualism is not enough. They also have to speak German and they have to speak French. So what happens is that when they start reading and writing, the children start reading and writing in German initially, right? So even in preschool, when Luxembourgish is used orally for all the activities, when the teacher does a read aloud, the read aloud is in standard German, right? Um, and remember that there is mutual intelligibility here because some might consider Luxembourgish a dialect of German, right? So there is mutual in uh, intelligibility. So the idea is that you start doing the read alouds in, in, in German, uh, but you speak and do all the other conceptual difficult things that we do with little children in the language that they speak at home, Luxembourgish. Um, but when they start to write, they start to write German, standard German, not Luxembourgish, which is not written. Uh, and then French is introduced from the second half of grade two. That is, when the children are about eight years old, French is introduced. Throughout primary education, Luxembourgish is used orally, very fluently. And what happens before we get to the high school, in the upper grades of elementary education, what you see is you see children researching, for example, during a, a, a lesson that may supposed to be during one language or the other, researching in French or German, depending, because they have those two languages at their disposal, right? So that the teachers never uh, restrict them to the use of only one language, to the use of either German during German time and French during French time, but allow the children to use their entire language resources, which they're developing, they're little still, but they're developing them to make meaning and to understand and to do research and to become more um, cognitively competent. <coughs> In high school, the situation changes, again, because they're determined to make everybody uh, trilingual, but also, and we have to remember this, because uh, this is a country that also excludes as well as includes so they have two systems at the secondary level, one which is called classic, the classical uh, high school, and then one which is the technical high school. In the classical high school, uh, which lasts seven years, uh, uh, so it's longer, one year longer than ours, um, instruction is in German and French, with in this way, which I'm going to explain, and they do have one lesson in Luxembourgish. It gets less and less as they grow older, uh, and usually falls out after three years. Um, but the emphasis is on German in seventh through ninth grade, and then in French in the tenth through the thirteenth grade. Why is that? Because again, the Luxembourgians don't like the Germans too much. I shouldn't say that, but it's true. <laughs> um, because you know they have been conquered or incorporated by them twice, uh, and so they favor French, and they think that French is still the language of culture, not German, uh, and therefore the thinking is that those who do a classical high school and do humanities, etc should be very, very proficient in French and should really know French culture, French thinking, French philosophers, French um, um, uh, literature, etc. And German is not as important. So children become very proficient in both German and French, but the emphasis in the upper grades is certainly French. That is the mark of culture, the mark of being educated. In the technical high school, the opposite happens. Most subjects are in German. Again, there is continuation of some subjects in French, but the idea has been, up to now, that uh, German is better understood by the students because, again, Luxembourgish and German are so close. So the kids who go to the technical high school are supposed to not be as competent, maybe not as smart, 
according to their um, their um, uh, um, their categories, and therefore. Um, what we need to do is make them understand the lessons and therefore German is easier for them. Uh, it's now important to remember what's happening because what is happening now is that most of the kids who are going to the technical high schools are the, what do you think? Portuguese. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what happens. The Portuguese immigrants end up in the technical high school. And all of a sudden, French is easier for the Portuguese speakers because it's another Romance language than German. So it's getting very complicated because, again, we set up our school systems not understanding the mobility of globalization and what is happening, right? So school, school systems are static when our populations are very, very fluid. So um, it's getting a little bit uh, tense there, and I don't know what's, what, whether there's going to be changes. But what I want to emphasize is throughout the school system, there is the possibility of continuing to speak in, in Luxembourgish, uh, continuing to do research in one language or the other, even when the subject is supposed to be in one language or the other. Because the idea of the Luxembourgish school system is to make everybody trilingual by the time they graduate. That is, that is the purpose. So what can we say about, uh, or how can we summarize then, this language education policy? Um, what there is, is Luxembourgish used in elementary level uh, and the technical high school, uh, and less so in the high school, uh, in the classical high school. Uh, but certainly throughout in all oral inter interactions, a lot of Luxembourgish. The literacy is introduced in German because it's assumed to be easier, and the French is introduced later and, the cl and in Lycée Classique because it's assumed to be more difficult and it also has more prestige. So, throughout the educational system, Luxembourgish, German, and French are used to make meaning. There is then this adoption of dynamic plurilingualism, uh, and there is also the sense that these languages do not have to be used separately, right? These are the, those are the, the, the colors, right? That there are no borders among these languages, that these languages are interact, intersect, they're interdependent, they're in a continuum to um, continue to using, uh, to use um, Nancy's image, uh, and that this works together. Um, so, what we can then summarize before we get to the US, we're going to have to take a long stretch here, uh, is um, that there's very strong language in ethnifying in Luxembourg, uh, that there's a strong language education policy that favors a multiple multilingual education that is um, that aims to sustain. Oops, I'm missing an end there. So to sustain Luxembourgish and expanding their multilingualism by um, by making sure that the languages in schools interact. Uh, that's an image of a banyan tree. I use uh, I've used a banyan tree in my book. That lesson mentioned before, it's an image that I hold dear, and those of you who have been to Cambodia know that that is uh, also a temple there. Um, and um, I like to use this image because to me, it's, a temp it's the banyan tree that is holding up the temple, uh, and I always say that it's all the interdependence of these languages, it's the ability to use all the language resources of children that really hold up the temple that is the child, and at the same time, in this case, is protect, protecting Luxembourgish as the national language so that the other languages don't take over. So, just to summarize then, um, uh, this just brings it all together, because I'm sure you have now forgotten where I started, uh, <laughs> and um, I want to make sure we just sort of think about it, right? How uh, Gallo, and I'm just going to do what is in bold, right? How Gallo uses traditional language as a subject, as an optional subject, and of course the whole, where does it, where does it end in this monolingual bilingual continuum in monolingualism in French with no recognition? Uh, 
that for Sotsil and Celtal there is the possibility of transitional bilingual education, but remember that the addition of this majority uh, language really is supposed to lead to, to subtract the bilingualism, it's supposed to take away the Sotsil and Celtal, but what it does is it actually uh, fails, it's a, it's a flat tire that you end up with, uh, with the Maoris, we have an immersion revitalization bilingual education program, uh, and certainly uh, with the idea that these languages have to be used to adapt yourself to the situation in which you find yourself, uh, and therefore the image of the all-terrain vehicle that adapts its wheels. And finally, in Luxembourg, this idea of multiple multilingual education with the conception that one can have a dynamic bi or plurilingualism and the banyan tree as the image of the languages intersecting. Okay, so what can we learn about language education policy from these four cases? I think we can learn that despite any postmodern thinking that treats languages and identities as constructed and fluid, we have to recognize power differences and we have to recognize the agency of dominant communities in devising different strategies of privilege and control through education. And I think the question for us is, is there something we as educational linguists can do? Uh, and that brings me to Spanish in the US to sort of end. Uh, are you tired? Are you following me? Okay, so here we go. So Spanish in the US. I'm doing okay in time, Bridget? Plenty of time. Okay, great. Okay, so let's just review again for all of us, because this I'm sure you all know, right? You know that Spanish is a Romance language. You know that it has a long history, which we forget. We have to remember that it was the, f the language of the first permanent European settlers in 1513. But we also have to remember that it has been the language of the dispossessed, of those who uh, lived in Florida and Louisiana when we purchased those two states, of conquest and war, of those that were the were that lived in territories uh, that were taken over after the Mexican-American War in 1848 and the Spanish-American War in 1898. So it's important to remember that. And I think we, oops, uh, <laughs> uh, I think we also have to remember that is the language of, and uh, not off, but anyway, of laborers, immigrants, and, and a Spanish-speaking diaspora. And uh, so this is all important. And I think it's, it's important to, from the beginning, understand that the situation with Spanish in the U.S. is complex, because we tend to think of it as an immigrant language and uh, we want to emphasize, again, that there is a continuum of Spanish speakers in the U.S. Uh, and that um, if some of us have been here for a very long time, maybe before the other uh, English-speaking European settlers, and it's important to remember that. Um, it's a very big language in the U.S. It's spoken by 14% of the population at home. Those of you who teach, think of that. Uh, and if you count those that study Spanish and the Latinos who say they don't speak Spanish at home, like Nelson, but maybe there's a lot more Spanish than he, than he gives us credit for, than he gives himself credit for, uh, it's really 18% of the population. Again, think of that. It's one of five, right? And many, many city schools, I don't know about here, but in New York City I can tell you that one of two children in New York City speak languages other than English at home, and one out of four speaks Spanish at home. So it's, uh, it's, the, it's a, a big population that we have to remember when we think of education. Um, we are the fifth largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. The U.S. is, even though we don't recognize it. Uh, we are the fifth largest Spanish-speaking country. 63% uh, of them of uh, Spanish speakers come from Mexico, followed by Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Salvadorans, Dominicans, Guatemalans, and Colombians. So that's, that's just to review the facts. Um, but I also want to review and remind you, because uh, maybe Nancy and I are 
uh, the oldest people who remember all of this, but I'm speaking to a lot of young people, and uh, we forget that there's a history behind um, the language rights of Spanish speakers in the U.S. It's a history that has been tied to civil rights, um, and certainly that came out of the struggles of civil rights, uh, and we can't forget that. Uh, the Bilingual Education Act, for example, was passed in 1968 when uh, the Vietnam War was uh, raging, uh, when uh, women's lib uh, was also raging. That's uh, Atlantic City for those of us who remember it. Um, and, you know, there it is. It's, it was part of a whole movement. But I think what has to be said is that in, certainly in the last decade there have been erasures of, these, uh, of all these uh, rights, a silencing and a stepping back from the positions that we had about Spanish and education in the U.S. And I think that has to also to be recognized. It's something again, you know, I, I feel like Nancy could have done this talk, because every time I say something, I say Nancy, but it's true that, you know, I learned a lot of these things from Nancy, so I have to repeat them. So, um, important to remember that um, the B word, what Jim Crawford has called the B word, bilingualism, has been completely silenced, and this is, I think, most, um, most prevalent in uh, the naming of legislation in offices, in federal offices. For, so, for example, the Office of Bilingual Education and Minority Language Affairs is now the Office of English Language Acquisition, etc. Everything that was bilingual is now English, right? So the silencing of this word, and I think, again, we have to recognize this. But I think... Um, <coughs> It, Spanish is in, a, it's, it's in a different moment right now, and, and it's also this dialectic is changing it in different ways. I'm talking about Spanish in the U.S. One is it continues to be uh, a minority or a minoritized language in many ways, uh, and I think proof of that is that uh, 21 states have uh, now lost uh, declaring English the official language, and there has been a lot of restriction of the use of Spanish, and I don't have to remind you uh, that California, Massachusetts, and Arizona have actually forbidden uh, the use of bilingual education, so that uh, this is a movement uh, that we are witnessing. But at the same time that there is this going on, Spanish is acquiring a global uh, role, it's, and this is new. Uh, it's a language, for example, that is most studied in, in Europe after English, it's very popular because of pop artists and singers and artists and I don't know who else, you know, you know them all. So it, it, it turns out that it now has a new presence. Uh, it is an expanding global language. Because it is so big in the U.S., it has the largest Spanish-speaking market with buying power because it turns out that the Spanish-speaking population of the U.S. has uh, the largest, the greatest buying power in the world. Um, in the U.S., we have 200 TV stations, 730 radio stations. Um, the, in Los Angeles and Miami, the TV stations that transmit and the radio stations that transmit in Spanish um, have larger audiences than those that transmit in English. So big, right? And in New York, those of you who know La Mega and Amor know that that's the number one radio uh, show that everybody listens to in New York. Um, and about print publications, it's not only a, a language that is heard, it's a language that is read. Uh, in the U.S. there are 18, uh, 1,851 print publications, 38 dailies, 384 weeklies, 513 magazines. So it's an expanding global language and therefore this expansion of it as a global language also affects its role within the United States. And so we have this dialectic of Spanish being a minoritized language with a history of oppression but also uh, a language of growth and expansion and I, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see what is happening. So that, of course, has had an effect on what is happening about with U.S. Spanish in schools. 
Uh, for non-Latinos, it is Spanish is taught as a subject, of course, in intermediate high schools and colleges and universities. Uh, we know that it is a language that is studied uh, in college uh, by more than half of college language students, 53 percent, and it is also the language that is studied by the majority of high school students, 69 percent of U.S. students uh, learn Spanish. Uh, it's always taught as a foreign language, right, to non-Latinos. Uh, but still there is a popularity there that did not exist before. Uh, for non-Latinos, there's also possibilities of bilingual education at the elementary and intermediate level, even though these are <coughs> rare. Uh, but certainly there are a few immersion bilingual education programs uh, in the nation. And um, many more, this is becoming more of an option, of two-way immersion bilingual education where you have both uh, speakers of Spanish and speakers of English who come together to be educated. But always sort of, that's a language of the other, right? Um, for Latinos, what is there um, in terms of developing our own literacies and our own language? Um, well, there, is, there are transitional bilingual education programs for those who do not speak English well, who are developing English, uh, the emergent bilingual students that I speak about, and always with the purpose of language shift. Joshua Fishman always said, this is like giving someone a vaccine. You take a little bit of a deadly virus and you give it to them and then they're cured, right? So that's the idea. You end up with one wheel, right? The idea is to move them to English only. But at the same time, there are options that do not do this. There are options that really sort of develop two wheels, right? There are some two-way immersion bilingual education programs for, the few, for a few people. That is uh, the same programs that I spoke about before, where you have um, two language groups, uh, and they serve also uh, not only Spanish-speaking children who are developing English, but also Spanish-speaking children who are quite bilingual, because that is the majority of us, and Spanish-speaking children who may know, or Spanish-speaking heritage speakers who may understand the language, they have receptive ability, but they don't produce it anymore because we haven't taught them, right? So there are more and more of these two-way immersion bilingual education programs. But there are also one-way developmental bilingual education programs, I say, for the very few. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the complexity of the Spanish-speaking population or the Latino population in the U.S. has gotten so rich and so complex uh, that some of these programs that are called dual language, and I'm going to speak about dual in a second, uh, when you really sit there and look at them, uh, they are billed as being two-way because they're serving two groups, but in reality are only serving one group. And that is the reality in New York. I hear from Nelson there are all kinds of things happening in Philadelphia. You can fill me in later. But in New York, the few programs that there are, uh, when you really look at them seriously, uh, many of them are really one way in the sense that they're only serving Latin and the Latino population that now has a continuum of language, right? So some of them are only English speakers, some of them are bilingual, some of them are emergent bilingual in the sense that they're, they're um, developing English. So it's a whole continuum of people. Um, these programs are um, uh, claimed to develop dual uh, additive bilingualism, right? So the claim is you are going to develop these two wheels which are always going to be separate and we're going to be fine because we are going to be really bilingual. And what I want to think about today is what's in the dual, right? Um, what's in this additive bilingualism that we have been promoting? That idea of one plus one equals two. And that's the idea that we all promote, right? And, I th and what we want to question is the fact that dual views bilingualism from what I call a monoglossic perspective in opposition to, the, to Bakhtin's heteroglossia, 
right? So the idea that when you think about bilingualism this way, you're thinking with a monolingual lens. You're thinking about it as if you were a monolingual person who does not understand what a bilingual person is, and therefore you think of it as just the addition of something separate that has to be balanced. The two separate parts of the elements, a first language and a second language that has to be kept, kept separate at all costs. Uh, and English, of course, for uh, Latinos is always a second language. English as a second language. Uh, and therefore, it does not allow us to appropriate uh, English language practices as one of our own, right? So uh, I think these are things that we really have to question. Uh, uh, that um, <clears throat> if if there if they if we continue to consider these as second languages, then what we're saying is this is not an American thing to do. An American thing to do is to be an English monolingual. People that have English as a second language are immigrants, they're the other, they're these other people, they have all kinds of problems. But Americans, Americans speak English. And I think that the question is, um, how do we then see all this? So, the questioning of the dual for me is important. It is not that I am against a dual language bilingual education, uh, because for, unfortunately, they are the only spaces right now that exist in the United States to develop bilingualism. It is that I think that all of us as educational linguists should really start thinking about what can be done within those spaces so that all the language practices of the children can be appropriated and used instead of separating them to this extent. So one of the things that we have to remember is that in this dual, first of all, there's the silencing of the word bilingualism, right? But even after that, what we have is an additive <coughs> separation which never <coughs> allows us to be whole, right? It never allows us to be a bilingual whole. It always only recognizes the fact that we have a first language and a second language that are broken, that makes us broken, that do not come together in a holistic kind of way. Uh, and that it does away with the idea that languages are interdependent. The very, very old concept of uh, Jim Cummins a long time ago and the idea of interdependent language practices and the fact that these languages um, do uh, come together. Um, I want to just take you through the Common Core State <coughs> Standards because this is something that Nelson and I have been uh, working on. Um, and one of the things that we, I, I, want, I, I want to take you through um, what are the effects of thinking this way, of thinking separately, L1, L2, um, for what the children could do, right? Uh, one of the things that is happening is that we are developing English language standards where children can demonstrate what they can do in English. And then some states, fortunately, are also developing language standards in languages other than English, where children can demonstrate what they can do in Spanish or in another language. But what there isn't, and what Nelson has been trying to do in New York, is uh, trying to develop bilingual standards where the children can demonstrate what they can do using their entire linguistic repertoire, the entire bilingual continuum, and not just half, right? So that is this, the, my image of the integrated system rather than what we always do, which is that these two halves are always uh, judged and measured separately. Let me give you an example. This is just one standard. This is one standard for beginning students who are new to English. And the standard says that you are able to identify key individuals, events, and ideas as they're introduced in a text. And then what the teachers are told that they could do is discuss in a partnership or small groups the events and ideas introduced and illustrated in the text. And then it says, use graphic organizer to structure responses, repeating short answers and responding to questions using one-word answers and nonverbal forms of communication. And now I want to ask you, 
Why is it that, that we cannot allow beginning students in English to show what they can do it, using their entire linguistic repertoire? If it is true that what we're trying to do is measuring what children can do, if they understand and are able to identify key individuals, events, and ideas, why can't they show what they know, not with one-word answers or nonverbal forms of communication, but in the language that they know, in Chinese or in Spanish or in Korean or in, in uh, Arabic or whatever it is they know? I think we have to question what it is that we're doing, right? And what is it that, that we're after? Are we really after what children can do? Or are we thinking about something else? Are we thinking about how to, again, impose English as the national ideology behind all American citizens? So I think that this is, this is something that we have to work out. And that our, the, our way of thinking has, uh, I think, a lot of, of uh, repercussions about how children are measured and taught. So I'm saying that I couldn't finish without, you know, sort of talking about this, so I'll talk about it very quickly. I'm saying that there might be a way um, through translanguaging. Before I do that, I want to make sure that I tell you that translanguaging, the term itself was coined in Welsh by Ken Williams, and it was coined as a pedagogy in which the input is in one language and the output is in another. And since then, it has been extended to flexible bilingual use, especially in teaching and learning. And so it has been an expansion of the term, and many of us are using it, right? Um, so just to have a definition, um, I'm referring to translanguaging as discursive practices. Discursive practices that are the norm for bilinguals, and they're complex and fluid, and all of us who are bilingual know that our discursive practices are complex and fluid. And let me tell you, I have such problems with my iPhone because I do have the two languages, but I realize that half of what I write, you know, goes back and forth. So, I mean, I have to turn that off because it's not something, I mean, they, I think that the iPhone was designed by someone that thought about bilingualism as additive and does not realize that bilinguals use their, all, their entire language repertoire to communicate in much more fluid ways. So one, one um, definition are these discursive practices, but also then the pedagogies that build on these discursive practices to give voice and to release the conversations and ways of speaking and being that have been fixed and constrained by nation states and schools. And I think that that's important. If we're thinking of education, if we're thinking of educating all our citizens, all our people, uh, then we have to allow uh, them, uh, children especially, to make meaning with their entire lang language repertoire and not just to constrain them to what has been given to us uh, by language policies in schools. Um, so, um, what does translanguaging do for uh, US Latinos? Since we've been speaking about uh, Spanish in the US, um, one of the things that it does is it provides an alternative to just being English only or having to be balanced in one language and the other. We know that none of us are balanced in any kind of way, um, but um, I think, you know, I think uh, this is a problem between the talking about being bilingual and, and all of this and fluidity. This is a problem between the Mac and the, uh, and the uh, Dell, whatever this is, the, because I, this, was, this was not over. But what, what I, uh, and I, I see a lot of mistakes that I think were in there before, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that it does is this is releases uh, U.S. Latinos from having to, from, from this anglophone ideology that English only, English monolingualism is what all U.S. citizens need, do, have to have, and we, it's the only way of constructing knowledge. Well, what we know is that especially for Spanish, such an important language around the world, Chinese, Korean, you name it, all these languages that are expanding, Arabic, what they do is they open up a window to the world 
uh, in ways that uh, really construct our knowledge in a much more pluralistic kind of way. But at the same time, it also frees us from this Hispanophone ideology and the Spaniards, um, there may be many of you in the room, but yeah, uh, Cervantes, etc., are really after this ideology, which is, of course, they want to make sure that we continue. That's what maintains Spanish because Spain, you know, the Catalans want to get rid of Spain and the Basques do too, etc. So they want to make sure that we continue speaking Spanish as should be, right? But, and, and so there's this ideology that blames well, many of us for speaking what is always called Spanglish, right? Instead of recognizing that in any groups where languages come in contact, what we have is we have a fluidity of community, communicative practices that are not the same as when the language was in isolated places. So again, languages for a future in which globalization and movement are going to be much more of a reality. But certainly it shapes the new, new consciousness, new ways of thinking about ourselves, new subjectivities beyond those of global and national designs. And it also interrogates how languages and these standard languages, ways of speaking, which schools reproduce, really reproduce inequalities by making sure that our kids don't meet common core state standards. And because in doing this, it changes the locus of enunciation. Finally, someone, all of us can speak, and we speak maybe for different reasons. So I think that that's important. So I think what we have to, rem what, what I want to question today is this dual separation in which we're all involved. And think of it as maybe a new US strategy of privileging mon monolingualism and controlling bilingualism so that we cannot be America and we cannot be equal. Um, and then uh, through this, uh, unable to create a US Latino trans subject as an equal participant, unable to change the content of the conversation and change perspectives and terms so that we can't change this issue of having a first language and a second language, having a native language when we know that many people use native for exclusion of those of us who are bilingual, which is used in conversations and always privileges English monolinguals, and unfortunately and sadly also as an adaptive response of the Latino community itself as a result of the anti-bilingual backlash that makes us participate in our own powerlessness. So I think that that also has to be considered. Because, oh, I, got, oh, I wasn't finished. Um, so I, want, I, I just wanted to summarize this. I want to see where I am. OK, uh, I'm almost finished. Um, I just want to summarize this, because I know that you can't remember Gallo anymore. But I want to just take you through the mechanisms of control, right? Where Gallo was just erased, so it's tal was you know, what I call insufficient benevolence, when Maori was just late in adaptive inclusion, Luxembourgish as protection and expansion, but US Spanish has, it has been involved in both a silencing and a double entendre, right? So that this dual, I think, can be seen as a double entendre, and I think we have to question it, that's all. Um, so just to end with the uh, question that I started with, when, how, and for what purposes are non-dominant language and identity practices used in schooling. I think we have to remember that they're never neutral, but they're always conditioned by power. Uh, that state schools do many things for their own advantage. Uh, that these monoglossic language ideologies use and uses uh, means that bilingual children or children with different language practices are not given an opportunity to show what they can do therefore advantaging monolinguals, and that also non-dominant groups anxious to use their language practices in schools sometimes resist, but many, many times just adapt to the dominant practices participating in their own powerlessness and in dominant double entendres. I finish with a child's word because I always like to finish with a child, and the idea of my dynamic bilingualism came from this sixth grader who was sitting next to me one day and said to me, um, even though Spanish runs through my heart, English rules my veins. And I think the question that we have to answer as we think about all of this 
is how could we separate the heart from the veins and what happens to children when we do that and, and what is the result of not being able to use our all, the entire language repertoire in order to make meaning of a meaningful education. Muchas gracias. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that we're here with Harvey, uh, Wolfson, and Joshua Fishman, and the Lithuanian Jews in China and in Russia. And what comes back to the Hispanic community for me as a theologian is that the La, La Lenda Dominicana tells about uh, the first bishop of Chiapas, Bartolome de la Casas, yes. starting schools among the Carib people. And so here we are, more than five, between five and 600 years ago, going over the same history again. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that comment. And you do a beautiful job of you know, reminding us that mm -hmm. there's a long mm -hmm. I was wondering if we could go back a little bit to the slide you had about different options for, for schooling for Latinos in the U.S. And I was thinking, um, I know here in Philadelphia, but I know in New York as well, this, this rhetoric of school choice and yeah. the importance of having options, how that's playing into what, what are actual choices, what are possible choices, because at the same time we have this dominant talk about school choice, we also have a growing recognition of the segregation and how options are not options for everyone, and how much that is affecting who's going into what kinds of programs and who has access to particular language learning opportunities in this country. Yeah, um, I, th I, you know, I think many of us can answer this question, but certainly in New York what is happening, especially with the two-way immersion uh, bilingual education programs, is that they're often for gifted and talented children only. And so anybody who does not qualify as gifted and talented are excluded. So the options are just not there. And transitional bilingual education programs have been closing, um, maybe because of our own fault, because for so many years we used to say that they didn't work, and they don't work. But they work better than putting the children in English-only classrooms, right? Uh, and at least they give kids an opportunity to be in a safe environment, in a safe house for a little bit, and to make meaning of a new culture, um, a new language, and many times a new family. You know, we have to remember that these children often are adapting to a mother that they, they uh, that left them behind. Uh, 10 years ago, and now for the first time they're meeting. So, um, uh, so that is uh, sad to see. There are very, very few choices actually for transitional bilingual education. I don't know what's happening here, but in, in New York City, four, this four, <laughs> uh, in New York City, um, most of the programs are now ESL programs. With um, the caveat that I hope all of your wonderful ESL teachers. Um, I want to say that the program that uh, Nelson said uh, he was working in, no, uh, Nelson was the project director of this huge program, we call it the CUNY NICIB initiative, the uh, CUNY New York State Initiative on Emerging Bilinguals. We're working with 27 schools. Not all of them are bilingual programs, most of them in fact are ESL programs, but what we are making sure uh, we do is to give teachers, per ESL teachers, permission to do what they know how to do, which is to make sure that they build on the language practices of their children and to give them permission to translanguage in the classroom uh, so that they are not just um, doing English only, which they know doesn't work. So I think that. Um, I think that there may be time to change the paradigm sometimes from bilingual education in a traditional sense where it's coming from the top down to what, I, what we're calling bilingualism in education, which is coming from the children up. Who do you have in your classroom? What do you see? And then how can you use 
the languages that they bring from home in order to learn and in order to develop English. So I think that that's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I know that the, um, I think it's OCR came down with the... The um, what? OCR um, with the law or saying that New York City was not doing enough yeah. um, for yeah. bilingual students. I'm wondering if any of those 27 schools that you're working with or you, what you know about New York City on the ground right now, how that's taking place, like, are, is that affecting bilingual education or yes. making it more? Uh, yes, uh, they were opening up 22, 22 new bilingual programs this, this year. Uh, as as a result of the they OCR ruling, what? <laughs> They're opening again. Yeah, but you know, I think I think that there is maybe you know it's it's interesting when these restrictions happen, spaces open. As he talks about implementation and ideological spaces and how you open them up, and I think that there has been a space that has been opened mainly because the teachers know that they can't do it. So they, they have to find ways of, of doing it differently. The big um, issue that we have right now is that because they we're closing so many bilingual programs, the universities are not educating bilingual educators. So there is a, a, a shortage of bilingual teachers uh, to meet the needs of these new schools. So now everybody's scrambling to see what, they t what, what to do, because they, they have destroyed a system uh, and now they want to build it overnight, and that can't happen. Oh really? Oh, that's what, that's why your face is familiar. I know that's familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And out of these 27 schools, they're failing schools. I forgot to say that. Um, which is always wonderful to work with failing schools because if you work with failing schools, everybody wants to do better. So they they believe you and they they uh, they embrace what you're doing a little bit better. Um, but out of these 27 schools, about five of them. Are, are opening bilingual programs. In other words, they're going from, and everybody's doing translanguage in ESL too. So that is, uh, that's been a shift. Yes? Um, I was very interested in uh, the case in uh, Luxembourg, and you briefly talked about the, the population uh, languaging of Portuguese right. in Luxembourg. But could you tell me a little bit more about the um, the role of Portuguese in schooling. You know, you mentioned that yeah. uh, that the yeah. Portuguese immigrants yeah. generally go to German medium yeah. schools. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, what's interesting is that uh, because Luxembourg has such an uh, an open um, ideology about bilingualism, and the teachers from the very beginning value it. So, for example, the work that I've done in in um, elementary classrooms. Uh, the teachers always acknowledge all the languages of the children. Um, the, the circle time that we do in preschool or you know, the calendar, whatever, they always bring up children who speak especially Portuguese, but also some of the uh, languages from the former Yugoslavia. There are a lot of uh, those children in the schools. Uh, they're always uh, teaching others how to say things in those languages. Teachers always know um, how to read in Portuguese, know a few things in Portuguese, um, songs in Portuguese, stories in Portuguese. So there is a recognition, not enough. Uh, but the other thing I think that is done is because they participate in, in the European language portfolios, is the European language portfolios allow the children to have a history of their contact with other languages, which is not just school, but also what they do at home, visits, etc. And so um, during these times in which the children are working with the European language portfolios, uh, the Portuguese children are often writing in, in Portuguese. They also have after-school programs and weekend programs in Portuguese. It's a, it's a vibrant community. Um, and uh, those experiences are also brought into the classroom. Unlike here, where we have so many after-school weekend programs in Chinese, Korean, you name it, and those kids are never recognized for what they do in those schools and the teachers never know what's going on in those schools. I think that in Luxembourg, because there's a much more open um, attitude towards uh, plurilingualism in general, the Portuguese of the children are more recognized. That is not to say 
that the situation is solved. There's still tremendous inequality there, and the Portuguese immigrant children are the ones that go mostly to the technical high schools. Could you elaborate on that? How how there is while there is pluralism, there's also disjunction. Um, because. Um, well, because it has to do with social class and it has to do with the political economy of the country, right? Um, and I think that when we talk about education, we cannot uh, separate political economies of countries from what happens and what the results are educationally, so. Yes? I was curious about um, the term ethnifying, because yeah. we see really clear ways that um, language pedagogies and moves in the classroom can support translanguaging. Um, and I know that as kind of uh, frameworks like funds of knowledge or culturally relevant pedagogies are kind of expiring and being critiqued, how ethnifying, um, if that kind of stands in line with that? I don't know. I, I, you know I, I, I think I coined that uh, because I was working on the handbook on language and ethnic identity with Joshua Fishman. And he is uh, my mentor, my teacher. I respect him greatly. But I think as all good students, as he does, um, we all sort of go beyond um, our teachers. Uh, and so I had to reconcile his ideas about ethnic identity with my ideas about it being a, mo a much more postmodern fluid construction. So I thought that by coining a verb, I would do better, <laughs> uh, because at least it would, and I would get away with his not noticing, <laughs> so um, it would, uh, it would, uh, may, may, it, it would be understood that these practices are indeed fluid, and that they're contingent on the situation in which we are all uh, involved, so it's, it's the idea of it being a, a practice, a verb, an action, and not just a characteristic of a group. And do you see? Do you have any ideas about how, in schooling, um, connecting with practice? How, uh, because classrooms can be racially and ethnically exclusionary spaces as well. How um, that can be a part of the program, in addition to just fluid language practices, which are very identifiable mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Trans-ethnifying. <laughs> Trans yeah. Well, yeah. Um, or I guess I'm just asking because I, I can imagine models and practices that um, can be implemented for supporting translanguaging. Right. How ethnifying right. um, is also a crucial part, but it's not right. um, analogous to language because right. it's not. Well, you know, I'll just say this, and I may be completely off here, but uh, I'll say what I think, because um, I always do. Um, <laughs> one is that um, I think, again, we're, just as languages come into contact and the languages cannot then be seen as two autonomous systems, when cultures come into contact, you can't see them as two cultural systems, autonomous cultural systems. Uh, so I think the notion of biculture, being bicultural or you know, being multicultural perhaps is not one that I feel that comfortable with. Um, I was born in Cuba, and so very early on I read a Cuban ethnologist um, by the name of Fernando Ortiz, who wrote in the 1940 a book called um, Contrapunteo del Tabaco y el Azúcar, which is uh, the counterpoint of the tobacco and the sugar. And um, in it, he talks about Cuban culture being a, a, a mix of African and European uh, elements. Um, and, and the idea that, and he, he says this in, in Spanish, but I'll try to translate it, the idea that what, what we have is a transculturación, a transculturation. And he defines, this, uh, he defines it as the, the thought that when there's genetic copulation, the child is never exactly the same as one of the parents, right? The child is somewhat very different. And in the same way, when cultural practices come into contact, the, the cultural practices, the ethnifying that occurs is one that is different. Um, I wouldn't want people to hold on to cultures or languages in static kinds of ways. I would want people to bring in those practices into being an American. I mean, that, that is my whole thing, you know, that, that 
We often see these kids as being poor, as being immigrants, as having a problem. And what is wrong with seeing them as enriching our lives as bilingual Americans and transcultural uh, in their outlook so that they can have contact with all the, the global world in which we all live. So that's my thinking. Um, in taking this global view that you take and uh, linking it back to your local context, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how having that global comparative view informs your work? Very much so. Very much so. I mean, I, I think that we always, um, we always have to position ourselves where we are at. Right, and I am very much, I, w I came to, the, to New York actually when I was 11. Um, and so I have to be, I have to position myself there. But, and I was a bilingual teacher as Nelson said, but if I had only seen bilingual education and language education within New York City, I wouldn't be able to see the possibilities outside of, of our reality. And I think part of what we do as scholars is imagine things that could be possible. And you can only imagine if you see beyond your limitations. You have to go beyond uh, your present reality while going back to it, because I think that's what grounds us. So I, I do it to inform um, my thinking within the context that I care the most about, which is, of course, uh, Latinos in the US. OK, sure. I'm curious about, um, I'm, as a former two-way and dual language teacher, I'm really curious about the reception of um, the ideas of kind of breaking up the notions of language separation. What has been the reception, if you have presented this to um, two-way teachers or educators or even researchers or folks at like <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, I, I think terrible, and I think that, um, you know, uh, there are two things. One is that um, the separation is easier, right? There's no question about it. And secondly is that I am not, so teachers understand it, right? It's much more difficult to think about how to work dynamically, linguistically with all this concept. But secondly, um, I'm not saying that the, you know, I always say like this, dual, the, the dual language programs, and I always call them dual language bilingual, so that people understand, because I mean, I was at a, a principal's office once, about a year ago, where the mother came in, and the teacher, the principal literally said to her, and I'm going to forget what I was going to say, but anyway, the principal literally said to her, um, sign her up for the duel. She's speaking in Spanish to the mother. Sign her up for the duel because if she's in the duel, she'll be bilingual. But if she's in the bilingual, she won't. <laughs> meaning, meaning that the transitional was not good. And then, of course, as always happens in, in schools, the principal had to go. And the mother sat there and said to me, what did she say? She said duel was bilingual, but bilingual wasn't. And that is, that is part of the problem. Uh, but, so I, I do think that there is um, room for separation uh, because it's easier for teachers, it's easier for instruction, um, and so that you have to have a macro arrangement, a macro language arrangement. But within those macro language arrangements, what you do with a micro language arrangement is important. It doesn't mean that when you're in Spanish, I mean, in some schools in New York, they do Chinese one week and English the next week. And I always say, what happens to the kids that, that uh, you know, don't speak one, one and they, they are rigorous about it, they're rigid, because the more rigid they are, the better it's supposed to be. That's not the way we learn languages. None of us learn languages that way. We learn language in interrelation, we, we develop new language practices in interrelation with our old language practices. Uh, and so that's what I'm saying, that within those spaces, which are easier for the teacher, not for the kids, but easier for the teachers, you have to allow for this language flexibility to take place. Um, I, I would say that um, the old bilingual educators are the most, most resistant to these ideas. Uh, but I think there, there, there is room for change. Uh, the world has changed, and we need to change with it. So 
we can continue the, the dialogue. We still have lunch and several hours of your visit, so let's um, thank you.